Okay, so good evening everyone. Uh, I'm uh, Arthur Mensch. I will present uh, tonight uh, uh, the recent work we did with Julien Mera, Gael Barocco and Bertrand Thirion about uh, how to scale dictionary learning for doing uh, massive metrics factorization and how to apply it to collaborative filtering. So just a quick word about why am I here. So I'm from uh, Inria Parietal Group which is a team, uh, academic team that does machine learning for neuroimaging. So we handle uh, fMRI data and try to understand the brain. And uh, in this domain, matrix factorization is very uh, important because it's a major ingredient because the data we're looking at is very high dimensional and, it's, and doing low rank matrix factorization is a, is a tool for um, reducing the, the dimension. And typically we look at very large data sets, so some of them are 2 terabytes, for example, and we needed to design some faster algorithm to perform this uh, matrix factorization. So, and this algorithm can be used in collaborative filtering, and this is what I'm going to talk about tonight. So the work here uh, was presented at ICML, but I will give a different spotlight. So uh, I will first uh, recall how we use matrix factorization for recommended systems. And then I will describe the algorithm and the adaptation we needed to make to our existing algorithms. And I will then give results on public data sets. So I guess you all know about collaborative filtering. Uh, the, it's, it's a technique that uh, uses uh, the ratings of uh, many users to predict the ratings that were not given by, by, by a user. And you, you want to, to use these ratings to recommend a user to watch a movie or to go to a restaurant or to click on this uh, uh, advertisement. And to do that, uh, basically the, the essential idea is that if you have a, a guy that likes two uh, war movies and you have other guys that like two war movies and uh, Saving Private Ryan, then you want to predict the first guy to watch, uh, to, you want to uh, uh, advise the first guy to watch uh, Saving Private Ryan. And so what we see there is that we need to uncover topics in items, and this can be formalized by uh, matrix factorization. So the way I like to see matrix factorization is that we embed items and users in the same space, lower dimensional space. So we have representative vectors for users and items that I will call alpha and d. And t uh, they're on the space of uh, dimension k, and typically the QF coefficient of this vectors is the affinity with the topic, P, the topic Q, and you predict the ratings, uh, the interaction between item and users by doing a scalar product and adding biases, and this allows to know the common affinity between a user and an item. And an item. Now, the learning problem that arises here is how to estimate uh, the representative vectors from known ratings and how to use them to uh, predict unknown ratings. So basically, if you take all of these uh, little scalar products and put them in the same, uh, uh, and, and gather them and use uh, common weights, uh, common vectors, you end up with a matrix factorization problem where you have a very large matrix X uh, of which you don't know every values, and you want to factorize it uh, as a product of two small matrices, low rank matrices D and A. And optionally, you can add constraints and penalties on the factors D and A in order to prevent overfitting or to to introduce some structure. And it's important to notice that we only observe uh, what I call the i omega star x, which is basically the mask uh, matrix that uh, with only known ratings. So in recommended systems, uh, there are typically millions of users, millions of items, and the matrix x is very large. So you want to have methods that scale with, uh, with in both directions. And the question we ask uh, in this work is how to scale the matrix factorization to very large data sets, and, uh, and, and we applied it on fMRI and on uh, collaborative filtering. So the formalism we can introduce to uh, what to perform this matrix factorization is, uh, as in many machine learning problems, uh, the minimization of an objective function. So we, you want to minimize the addition of uh, L2 reconstruction loss, which is the difference, the square difference between the ratings the true ratings and the prediction given by the scalar products. And you had, you had some L2 penalty typically to uh, regularize your problem and to prevent overfitting in order to be allowed to, uh, uh, to predict unseen ratings. So there are two categories of, um, of methods that are typically used for, uh, so to solve this problem. The first one is alternating minimization and the other is stochastic gradient descent. 
So alternating minimization basically take uh, the objective function above, and uh, which is uh, which depends on two factors d and a. And what you do is you minimize over a, and then you minimize over d, and you repeat. And uh, since the problem is convex in d and a, uh, it typically converges. And what's What's uh, interesting about this is that there is no parameters to set, which is very important if you have a very large data set because you don't want to cross-validate on the parameter of the solver because you will lose too much time. And but the problem with this kind of approach is that it's slow and memory expensive because at each iteration you basically load the whole data set. Uh, so this is also known as coordinate descent uh, and you can basically vary the way you minimize over columns and rows of A and, 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 and D. Then the other uh, category of, uh, of method that is used is stochastic gradient descent, where you see your objective function as a sum of pointwise loss function. Uh, so the pointwise loss function is simply the difference between the predicted and, uh, and, the, and the true ratings uh, plus some uh, regularization. And with, with this, you, you compute the gradient, the, the gradient of each of these pointwise loss, and stochastic gradient descent basically is uh, the following of the gradient uh, uh, in a stochastic manner, meaning that you select randomly the, the loss at each iteration. So it's fast and it's memory efficient if you set well the parameters. Uh, basically, this is what uh, flavor of this method that won the Netflix prize a, a few years ago. But the problem is that it is very sensitive to step sizes, and uh, you typically need to cross-validate on them if you want to have good results. So what we want here is to have the best of both worlds, meaning that we want a fast and memory efficient algorithm as stochastic gradient descent, but we would also like to have a, an algorithm that is a little sensitive to hyperparameter setting. And so that's, what, that's where we introduce an algorithm called subsampled online dictionary learning that builds upon the um, uh, the online dictionary learning algorithm, that is an algorithm that was introduced in computer vision, and that is known to be both efficient and uh, not dependent on hyperparameters. And what we do is to adapt it to handle missing values, so because uh, we, we don't know all the ratings, and we do it in an efficient manner so that uh, the algorithm is fast enough. So, in order to understand this algorithm, we need to uh, reformalize the, the objective function that I introduced before. Uh, so, if you look at the matrix factorization problem, forgetting about masks, then you, you end up, uh, and you do, uh, again, L2 penalties, then you end up with this kind of, um, of objective function where we only sum uh, the, the columns here. And the penalties can be made into constraints. And typically, if you, if you take this, the, the equation above, you can reformulize it to, um, as, a, as a problem with a latent factor, uh, alpha, uh, a sequence of latent factors, alpha j. And uh, the objective function becomes, uh, the, becomes a function of the less side factor only. And in dictionary learning, what you want to do is to find the left side factor and you consider the right side factor as a, as a latent factor. So the naive approach to solve this problem is to do alternating minimization again. And it works, but it's slow. But uh, a few years ago, uh, an, an algorithm was introduced that is online and that basically per performs some update on the dictionary D at each iteration by looking at a single column of the dataset X. So this is good because uh, it scales, and uh, what's important is that a single iteration at, uh, is, uh, depends on the sample dimension, but not on the number of samples. And, um, and the idea is that uh, the, the sequence of iterates will converge in a few epochs, so you only need to look at the, at the data set uh, twice or three times. And if it's large enough, it will even converge before reaching the end of the first epoch. So it's a very efficient algorithm in computer vision. It's also used for networks, fMRI, hyperspectral images. And the question is, can we use it efficiently for recommended systems where the additional constraint is that we have missing values? So in short, what we do uh, in this algorithm is to go a step beyond the, the online uh, algorithm. And you, you can see that as um, uh, to go from uh, the alternated minimization to the online algorithm, you go from 
looking at the whole matrix to looking at the single columns at each iteration. And in our case, we don't even look at single columns at each iteration, but we also ignore uh, all, the, um, all the coefficients that were not provided by the users. So, to understand a bit more about how uh, online dictionary learning works, uh, it relies on the minimization of uh, what we call the number bounding surrogate function. So, because of the fact that we here we only minimize the function with regard to D and we consider the right side factor as a latent factor, uh, we cannot apply uh, the typical uh, HDD or, uh, or gradient descent techniques. And what we do is, in, because of the latent factor alpha i star that you can see here, and that depends on the present dictionary D. And the essential uh, contribution of the online dictionary learning algorithm is to replace the alpha i star by, um, by a known uh, code alpha i that no, that no longer depends on D, but, where, but was computed by um, as a... Um, uh, using the dictionary, uh, the past dictionaries. And if you do that, you, you obtain a surrogate that you can update online at a low cost uh, that you can actually minimize using typical uh, block coordinate descent technique or, or gradient descent techniques. So, the, the, at each iteration, what you do uh, first is to compute the code uh, using the present dictionary uh, D. So the code is basically the coefficients that are used to reconstruct uh, your column xt. And using this code, you update the surrogate function we talked about, uh, which is actually parameterized by two low-rank statistics, at and bt. And using uh, these statistics, you minimize your surrogate, which you can do because the gradient has a, has a nice form uh, that you can see here. So if you... All of these three steps have a complexity that depends on the number of, of um, on the dimension of sample p, and this is a problem in collaborative filtering because we want to depend only on the um, on the number of seen uh, uh, ratings uh, that we call s. So the specification for our new algorithm is this: that it should be constrained to only use only known ratings. It should be efficient. So that uh, single iteration should depend only on the number of ratings provided by the user t. The so user t is basically as provided the columns there. And it should be principal, meaning that it should follow the online matrix factorization algorithm as, po as much as possible, so as to uh, show some convergence. So in practice, we go from a data stream xt, where we would have all the ratings, to a masked data stream mtxt with the, ra the ratings that were provided by user t. And the dimension of our problem has to be reduced uh, so that we get uh, some speed, uh, so, so that we are efficient. From p, uh, p is uh, the number of all items, to s, which is the number of rated items by the user t. And so to do that, we constrain ourselves to only use mtxt, uh, so the masked version of xt, in the algorithm comp uh, computation. And we ensure that every step of uh, the algorithm presented above have a complexity in the number of ratings. So, I, well, if we write again the, the, the previous algorithm and we write our algorithm on the right side, uh, we see that what we do is actually change the XT in a, in a clever manner so that everything basically looks the same and behaves the same in expectation. And in expectation on the, if you look at the mask as a, some stochastic mask where a, a user has, where randomly uh, rates some uh, items. And so I, I will invite you to check the paper uh, to, to understand better uh, the motivation be, behind the, the, um, the motivation behind the, the choice we made uh, for code computation, for uh, parameter aggregation for the surrogate, and for minimization of the surrogate. So we had some uh, pretty good results on this, at least the proof of concept on uh, collaborative filtering. So the validation we propose is classical. We use test uh, uh, root mean squared error uh, versus uh, CPU time, just to show that we are, are actually faster than uh, uh, our baseline, which is a coordinate descent solver, uh, which we selected because it had no hyperparameters to set, and which is pretty fast uh, in practice. So the reason why we compare ourselves to the coordinate descent solver is that our method has a, has a 
has a very little dependency on hyperparameters. So it seems fair to compare to something that do not require cross-validation for setting hyperparameters. And so the data set we used is unfortunately Movilance and Netflix because, uh, well, they're basically the biggest uh, um, data sets publicly available, but I'm pretty sure that uh, the industry has larger data sets. So we see that our algorithm perform better and better when you increase uh, the number of samples. And against a, a very little data set, so we've only one million ratings, we basically perform as well as the um, coordinate descent solver. So you need to look at the, the darkest curve because it's the best flavor of the algorithm. And um, well, if you have 10 million ratings, you will begin to be pretty faster. And if you look at Netflix, which has 40 time, four, 40 time, uh, 14 times the number of uh, movements, well, we actually get a pretty decent speed up of the order of seven. So what's interesting is that uh, if you look at test RMSE at the end, uh, it's all of the test RMSE are uh, comparable because basically we solve the same problem, but with a different approach. But if you look at convergence time, uh, we see that uh, when you increase the, da the, the data size, uh, well, we, we get, we get uh, a speed up that is bigger and bigger. And, well, on, uh, on Netflix, uh, the results are well above the state of the art because we used a very simple model, but it should be used uh, within the framework that involves matrix factorization, but with, uh, with um, added metadata and that kind of stuff, and, and, uh, and transformation, and, and all the things that were used to, to, to beat the, the Netflix price. So, a last slide on uh, how we are robust to learning rates. So, in uh, the online dictionary learning algorithm, there is a learning rate for uh, learning the parameters of the surrogate. And uh, the theory predicts that we should sell it in, uh, in this range, 0, 75, 1. And in practice, we just need to set it between 0, 8, and 1. And, and we see that all of this curve basically behaves more or less the same. Uh, and have the same uh, uh, end value uh, after convergence. So in conclusion, the take home message would be that online matrix factorization can actually be adapted to, uh, to face uh, recommended system problems and to handle missing value efficiently with very good performance in recommended system. And so the algorithm is usable in any rich models that involve matrix factorization, so this encompasses many things. Uh, there is a Python package available for production, and uh, also the article and the slides are available uh, uh, here. Uh, I will happily answer some questions. I don't know how am I doing in time. <laughs>